May I have your attention, please? Could you please take your seats? We're about to start. Director of Carimac, Dr. Livingstone White. Mr. James Moss Solomon, guest speaker, Dr. Susan Francis Brown, curator, Museum of the UWI Regional Headquarters, and widow of Professor Agri Brown and other members of the Brown family. Dr. Marion De Brun, former director of Caramac. <laughs> Distinguished guests, lecturers, colleagues, members of the faculty, good evening and welcome to our public lecture. Today we host the eighth staging of the Caramac Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture to commemorate one of the iconic figures of the UWI, the late Professor Emeritus Agri Brown, who served our university in various capacities, such as director of Caramac. Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, and the university's public orator, among his other public roles. In many ways, this lecture is of special importance to the management, staff, and students of Caramac, past and present. The lecture remains a memorial to Professor Brown's outstanding contribution to Caramac, to the UWI, and to education in the Caribbean as a whole. Congratulations to the final year students of Caramac's Integrated Marketing Communication Program and their course coordinator, Mr. Alpha Obika, for organizing this event, which forms part of a graded assignment. I have witnessed the group working very closely over the past few weeks with our lecturer, Mr. Moss Solomon, and I think they've learned a lot from this experience of planning this event. While we are not the ones who will determine the final grade, let us give the students a round of applause for their efforts. It is especially important that succeeding generations of 
CARIMAC students are the ones who undertake the planning and organization of this event. And Professor Brown would be very pleased to know that it is a graded assignment established in a course called Communication Analysis and Planning, otherwise known as CAP2, that he himself lectured for several years. This student assignment in the form of a public activity is but one of the ways in which we keep our curriculum relevant and practical in our various degree programs. This event also forms part of CARMAC's Open Week, which is usually held the last week of teaching in the second semester. The Open Week is designed to give students an opportunity to showcase their work to public audiences and gather feedback. On Monday night, the final year students in broadcast journalism television, as well as students of animation and film production, displayed their practical assignments as part of a product called CARMAC Student Network. Last Friday, students hosted a job fair and networking event as part of a brand known as Kickstart Careers to provide opportunities for students to prepare for the work environment beyond their classroom experience. And on Friday, we will have the airing of the top two radio documentaries and the launch of the Caramac Times magazine publication for 2018. Professor Brown has left a great legacy upon which we must continue to build. Your presence here indicates that we have your support in continuing to develop Carimac, which, even after 44 years, must now address new challenges related to education and training in media and communication across the Caribbean. All of this while working towards UWI's new strategic vision of becoming an excellent global university rooted in the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to CARIMAC. Thank you for your continued support. Do enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, Dr. White. Uh, some important housekeeping matters. The washrooms are located beyond the main door on the left. In an emergency, hopefully there will not be any, but in an emergency, the emergency exits are to your right and your left, and the assembly point is 50 meters across the road in the bus park. But as I said, hopefully we won't need to make use of that. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of a few people. Dr. Susan Francis Brown and members of her family. the representatives of the Grace Kennedy Group, led by Mrs. Takita Chance Wilson. <laughs> Former director of CARIMAC, Dr. Mario De Bruyne. <laughs> Other distinguished members of the UWI academic family traditional and strong supporters of CARIMAC. Ladies and gentlemen, all distinguished students who will be distinguished when they've completed their programs, welcome. To get you into the mood, I have a note here which tells me that we're going to have some music that will be delivered by trumpeter David Samuels. All protocols observed. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. How are we today? And about the right, that's good. 
All right, so as I said before, I am a trumpeter and I will be playing for you. I hope you do enjoy this. a certain magic in live good live music that we don't get with the recorded stuff but I could see some people couldn't help moving like Faye Ellington C. Ward Mills yes okay. I'd also like to welcome a few other people I see Professor Hopton Dunn director on sabbatical of Karimak has managed to pull himself away from extensive travel and work to be here. Welcome. And <laughs> Professor Roy Ogier, long standing servant of the University of the West Indies, <laughs> and also a long standing servant of Karimak. Welcome. We are approaching the reason we're all here this evening, but I'd like to spend a few minutes telling you how we actually got to this point. Some years ago, I was thinking of a way in which 
we could strengthen the profile of Karimak and also contribute to the varied discourse on important matters of media and communication. And I happen to have been sharing my thoughts with then lecturer at Karimak, Patrick Prendergast. And we discussed what could be done and eventually the discussion centered on an event that would be used to highlight important matters relating to media and communication disciplines. And having concluded that, it was Patrick who said, wouldn't it be good for us to have this attached to someone who has been outstanding in media and communication disciplines, who has served the university, and someone who has been close to Karimak? And instinctively, intuitively, both of us utter the name at the same time. But we had to do something else. We had to ask the great man whether he would allow his name to be attached to the event. And he agreed. And so here we are this evening at the eighth version of the Karimak Agri Brown Distinguished Lecture. But I'd just like to, if I can find it, tell you who we have had delivering the lectures before this evening. The first in 2010 was delivered by Mr. Gary Allen, then the managing director of RGR Communications. That was followed by Mr. Mike Fennell then president of the Jamaica Olympic Association. I must tell you that Gary Allen spoke about journalism for a changing Caribbean. And Mike Fennell spoke about media and sport partners in national development. And that was followed by veteran journalist and playwright Barbara Gloudon, who spoke about media and the arts followed by Mrs. Evelyn Smith, then of the Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association, who addressed the issue of the connection between media and that important economic sector, tourism. Mrs. Janet Morrison followed, playwright and lecturer, spoke on pure drama and revisiting the radio play, which was an important part of entertainment in the Caribbean that we don't hear much about today. Followed by Mr. Adrian Robinson, author and public relations consultant, who discussed the new universe for the Mac in Carimac. Yeah. Mr. Michael Jarrett was last year what those eyes have seen, reflections on key issues in journalism and public relations. And Mr. Jarrett who's, is a public relations consultant and a journalist. So we have arrived here this evening with this year's edition of this wonderful event. But to tell you about tonight's lecture, I'm going to ask Karimat student Wynette Strawn to come forward. Mr. James Moss Solomon, Dr. Susan Francis Brown, members of the Agri Brown family, Professor Wariboko, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Professor Hopeton Dunn, Director of CARMAC currently in sabbatical, on sabbatical, Director Living, Dr. Livingston White, Acting Director of CARMAC, Mr. Gary Allen, Chief Executive Officer of the RGR Glena Communications Group, Special Invited Guests, Lecturers, Students, Good Evening. 
This evening, the task of introducing our guest speaker is a great privilege. And for those of you who are already familiar with him, you can understand my apprehension to perform this task. How do I introduce and condense the achievements of such a person in three minutes? However, I was comforted by his words when I asked him what he would like to be said of him. He said, keep it short. If one takes a closer look at the alchemy of the achieving person, two distinct features stand out besides perseverance and hard work. These are pioneering spirit and willingness, a revolutionary and radical thinker. Our guest speaker today is the living idiom of a man who happened to be born at the right time and right place and has maximized his, times and his time and effort successfully. He joined Grace Kennedy and Company Limited as a management trainee in 1971. Since then, he has served as distribution and warehousing manager, executive chairman of Hilo and Medigrace Limited, divisional director of international business, general manager of Grace Kennedy Merchandise, Divisional Director of Industrial Retail and Trading, and in June 1998 was appointed Director responsible for Corporate Affairs. He retired in 2007, but continues to sit on the boards of Grace Foods, Allied Insurance Brokers, Grace Kennedy Remittances Guyana, and CVM TV. He has contributed much to the development of the Jamaican business community through his membership in the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce, where he served as President for two consecutive terms. He was also Vice President at the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica for one term. He was on second man to the Mona School of Business as executive in residence 2002 to 2004. As a talented musician and sportsman, he has represented Jamaica at the Commonwealth Games and the Central America and Caribbean Games in swimming and water polo. He was the president of the Jamaica Gulf Association and vice president of the Caribbean Gulf Association. He remains the youngest person to swim the cross the harbor race at age 10 in the year of our independence. He continues to play with his band 50-50 and is proficient on the keyboards, guitar, and bass. He has also served as alma mater Jamaica College as chairman of the Board of Governors from 1989 to 2005. He is currently the chairman of the Grace and Staff Community Development Foundation, a director of the Grace Kennedy Foundation, and the chairman of the UHWI. He continues to serve with the hopes of achieving his vision of bettering this, Jamaica, this generation and ultimately Jamaica. Ladies and gentlemen, without reservation of resounding applause, please make welcome Mr. James Moss Solomon. Thank you. That's very good. Are you adept at Excel? No. PowerPoint? No. Publisher? Not really. Exactly in what area of technology mm -hmm. are you proficient? <laughs> Snapchat, Pinterest, Instagram, Vine, Twitter, you know, the big ones. I'm surprised you didn't say Facebook. <laughs> That's for old people, like my parents. <laughs> That's funny. Well, Amy, when you're working for me, you have to have those kind of research skills because I'll send you things for you to comb through and get the answers and send them to me. So for that, you've got to be really good at technology. For stuff like that, no problem. I'll just ask Siri. You, you'll just ask Siri? You know, Siri tell me this, Siri find me that. We're all good getting you the answers. Tell Siri I want you ready to go at 8 sharp each and every morning. I don't understand. What don't you understand? What you just said. You don't understand be ready to go? No. You said eight, right? Yes. Eight, like, in the morning, eight? Yes, in the morning. Yeah. That kind of doesn't work for me. Who gets up at eight? I do. I Skype with my French boyfriend in Paris until, like, three in the morning. I don't even get to Starbucks until, like, ten, where I order my grande chai tea latte, three pumps, skim milk, light water, 2% foam, extra hot, but not too hot. So if it's okay... I work best in the morning at 10.45. <laughs> wow. Amy, I don't think we're going to be a good fit. Why are you so negative? I can sense your hostilities, and right now I am not feeling very safe. I've been here for over five minutes, and the only nice thing you have said to me was nice resume, which I typed all night for this meeting with you. You've given me no guidance, no validation, no encouragement, no supervision. Is there an HR director somewhere? H HR director? Yes, I need to speak to someone. You don't work here. Are you firing me? 
Okay, yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, Suzanne, nice to see you as always. And all other protocols observed and the Brown family. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And as usual, I'll promise you something <coughs> not traditional, maybe a little bit different. Okay, I can talk loud. I used to work at Grace Kennedy Warehouse. You heard it on the introduction. <laughs> Warehouse was 300 yards long and I could call somebody at the back. <coughs> News, information, and decision making in business. Different sides of a coin. Constraints or benefits for Jamaica in a global environment. The topic was chosen for me by a group of students of Carimac, and if you could take down the sound a little bit, it would be better for me, because I'm about to get a feedback. <clears throat> um, and they have decided, they spent nearly the last six or so Monday afternoons with me, informing me of what perspective of young people were. Before I begin, the late Professor Agri Brown is well known for his academic prowess not only at the UWI, but through his interaction with the distinguished universities in the Ivy League that, that he taught at, including Rutgers, Princeton, and the notable Howard. <coughs> However, it was not those achievements that caught my attention as being the mark of the complete man. And I'd like to mention two of these. As a head boy of Cornwall College and the captain of a winning the Costa Cup team, he was testimony to the fact that boys could play sports, accept leadership, and still perform academically. <clears throat> this is a legacy that we could emulate today and encourage parents and students of a path that seems to be currently completely forgotten. To read, to write, to teach well were the hallmarks of this great Jamaican. The second thing that I'm grateful for is his collaboration with the late Professor Carl Stone in February 1976 in editing a series of essays that shed a bright light on the control and influence of a particular stratum in Jamaica. One of the most important articles is by Stanley Reed entitled, An Introductory Approach to the Concentration of Power in the Jamaican Corporate Economy and notes on its origin. This we all colloquially know as the 21 families. <clears throat> we seem to have forgotten the potential of this controlling element for doing good or bad, and today we embrace the new controllers' families with almost childlike innocence, born out of a complete ignorance of our history. I have been trying to update this work, but as other matters have been very pressing, my research and writing time has been seriously impaired, but it will happen in 2019. The concept of news, including its rapidly growing sources and media, is not necessarily interchangeable with information, which is the basis for making logical connections or seemingly unconnected events as a process in decision making. I will explore some of the aspects of media development and reach and the development of different generations on the ways that they utilize both elements. I'll give my opinions on the positive and negative in impacts and aspects as they impact Jamaica as a small island economy in a global environment. I hope to identify a simple connection between the usage of news and or information and our own economic and social sustainable development. First, a few historical footnotes. <clears throat> in the lifetime of my father, James Moss Solomon Sr., 1894 to 1977, 
and my own personal experience since 1951, the anecdotal handing down of information has been in the oral tradition of all our ancestors. These include African, Indian, Irish, English, Scottish, and Jewish, all of whom thrived on the art of storytelling as a means of transferring historical information and the creation of legends that inspired great pride in our people. To these peoples, the com communal storytelling not only told of the history of religions, tribal associations, the universe, and creation, but provided essential information on climate cycles, agriculture, and the movement of animals. These all provided valuable information for harmony, conservation, and coexistence with nature, the essential ingredients for human survival. Captured social order, ecology, astronomy, anthropology, and education within the various groups. My father did not have the radio in his early life that found him as a working man of 20 at the start of the First World War in Montego Bay working for the multinational United Fruit Company. News of the war came by way of references in the Gleaner released by the colonial office and which were far out of date in comparison to today's instant live and direct on the battlefield television. In fact, much of the war news was, restrict, was restricted, so Jamaica worked for its own survival in a world of limited information and the silent movies with piano accompaniment played from a mu sheet music or on the Victrola. How many people in here know what a Victrola is? Oh, okay. No, no, no I'm not embarrassing those who are in my generation. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Alex, when I'm finished, I'll explain Victrola to those of you where well, we have some refreshment because <laughs> you'll probably be shocked. So, and the, the, the relaxation was really in the cinema, but it wasn't cinema with sound. The, s the shipment of bananas was a major enterprise for several loading points across Jamaica. One important note is that United Fruit Company's accounts had to be ready for dispatch to New York on the fourth working day of each month. This feat is not often achieved today even with the addition of network computers and super fast connectivity. The first international telephone call took place on April 4th, 1936, and this service connected Panama, the USA, Cuba, and Jamaica. At the time of my birth, our house phone in Kingston had four digits, 7405. Some years after that, when I was a teenager, I had a six, seven, six, four, oh, five, and now we're up to several numbers. Now we have two codes about to start. And most people had a party line. This now, for the younger folks in here, this was not a carnival thing, right? Or, or a dance hall thing. It was a shared service where if you pick up the phone, you could hear somebody else speaking on your phone. And, um, you know, that was quite interesting in news. <laughs> the Second World War <clears throat> provided greater challenges. Food supplies from Britain were diverted to the war in Europe. America and Canada profited from sales to Britain of grains, arms, and ammunition. We here in Jamaica had to become self-sufficient in many agricultural products and coconuts and corn were the base on which the local Seprod Limited emerged. My son, Jeffrey, in the front row is currently one of the managers of Seprod. Access to telephone services was limited to a few landlines and was connected through central operators. So the operator was a gatherer of information. You had to at least tell them your girlfriend's name in order to get connected to her household. So, um, come a long way, you know, I couldn't tweet her. <laughs> radio via short and long wave radios, 
connected the few persons who could afford them with many different broadcasts in several languages. Remember Grundig and those German-made Telefunken and those right there. Palace Amusement Company showed news of the world reels before the main movies and so did the many private cinemas in rural towns. Rediffusion came to Jamaica on July 9, 1950 when the British-owned Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation, a subsidiary of British Rediffusion Group, started the change into what today we know as RJR. Yes, people, young people, cable radio in 1950. Okay, okay. We were hot. <laughs> Initially, four regional sites were established and 200 boxes were located in public places, and this soon expanded to reach several thousand households. It was a broadening of the reach and the timeliness of information, a new dimension for advertising and for Jamaican cultural development and expression. The Gleaner carried a lot of international and local news daily, and in many areas in rural and urban Jamaica, there was a system that allowed for a full discussion of the news. Firstly, for the person who could afford the price of the newspaper, there was a rental system, that's pay for read, that allowed the literate public to read the gleaner and return it to the, however you describe it, entrepreneur, landlord, or librarian. This greatly expanded the reach of readership beyond the number of newspapers sold or even the extrapolation of family readers. I guess in economic terms, this was a kind of multiplier effect. The concept of families sitting down together for dinner also extended the awareness and discussion of world events to the children. Secondly, there was a reader in many communities which had low levels of literacy Readers would sit in a central area commonly known as Piazza and regale the listening audience with stories of interest to the community or international events. This would have included reports or notices relating to agricultural boards, collection schedules, shipping related to loading bananas, and the days of acceptance of sugar cane at sugar factories. This small, voluntary this small voluntary contribution provided a return on the purchase price, good enough to buy the traditional QQ of white rum, which was so essential for wellness and long life. <laughs> this was a subscription service without the cable or internet. In both cases, there was also great interest in the progress of cases before the courts especially the few murders, mainly domestic-related, and divorce proceedings, both offering particularly salacious and juicy topics. This was the predecessor to Playboy. In addition, the case of the reader, there was always an opportunity of adding a personal twist, emphasis, and the power of distorting facts was a matter of personal conscience. The advent of television brought a new perspective that would have broadened the access to and the international reach of sources of news. The early hours of operating between 4 p.m. and 10 p.m. daily grew quickly to 24 7, 365. However, this was not always satisfactory in providing the news and the analysis of the news. Today, the television news and analysis occupies less than 12%, that's 30 hours per 168 hour week. And even this time cannot give full context and context of news information, whichever you choose, and it is characterized by incomplete clips and sound bites. Personally, I have some difficulty in finding out why people are shooting at each other or protesting in the newscast or even which gangs are aligned to various political parties. There seems to be some imbalance as possibly 20 to 25% of the news previously mentioned is taken up with sports. 
Incidentally, there's a total of 70 hours per week that can be defined as social content. And that 26% includes various entertainment, contests, contests, music videos, and comedies. This leaves a 73% foreign content of mainly soaps, movies, and some general education presentations by National Geographic and others. Yet we are seemingly unaware of the foreign influences on social behavior. Are we all cushy and hello, hi, bye, bye? <laughs> the typical dog bites man versus man bites dog analogy has been the most common descriptive of what are the items that make the news in a limited time frame. This may in itself promote a limitation of what is carried and a type of journalistic editing can exist that could cloud some real issues. This is not meant as a direct criticism of journalists and I realize that editors must make decisions regarding content, audience interests, and economic returns. The easiest possible blockage of information for decision making could be the fact that some type of rabies or animal borne disease could be completely overlooked in the dog bites man case. The second example is really very close to home uh, as it concerns one of Jamaica's best surgeons who was badly bitten by a dangerous animal while jogging in Upper St. Andrew as a result of the carelessness of a homeowner who failed to lock the gate. If that surgeon's hands had been damaged, we would all be at jeopardy for specialist procedures that could save our lives or those of a loved one. But dog by its man is no news. And as a consequence, the law relating to keeping dangerous animals is not enforced. The lack of information keeps us guessing about a firm decision on persons in unsecured premises keeping pit bulls and other aggressive canine species. Could social media fill that gap? I'm not quite certain. I've used these simple examples to open the discussion of the impact of media treatment or lack thereof in translating news to information and into decision making. So I start first with the news. Firstly was this historically dominated by relatively few sources and although it was easier to assimilate, remember an informed decision making was also subject to the manipulation of persons or nations with influence over those media. To me in hindsight only, the control of the previously mentioned BBC was a carefully executed colonial strategy, perhaps even a policy measure. The challenges, secondly the challenge to the British Empire were enabled by the expansion of radio and television and this allowed for the development of a counter strategy to world domination aspirations by Germany twice in one century. Thirdly, this in my estimation led to the open development of the propaganda stage of news manipulation firstly to the enemy and secondly to the local personnel. It was taken to new heights in the evolution of the Cold War with hot news. Cold War with hot news. Few facts but loud noises and very few measurable outcomes. Fourthly, the gauntlet was thrown down by the Soviet Union and was accepted by John F. Kennedy and like the recently run Grand National at Aintree last Saturday, the race to space was on, and this jousting competition replaced nuclear war. Fifth, it is important to note that neither side, side disclosed their failures voluntarily. We knew about those that went into orbit and returned, but not the others who just went out there forever. Six, then media started to show failures live and direct on television with the moon landing and the later explosion of the shuttle denying the first black astronaut Ronald McNair his place in history. Seventh, due to the rapid technological advancements 
The news travels at light speed with almost instant connection. This therefore has a propensity for brain overload and for some it necessitates a withdrawal from broadcasting to narrow casting. Eighth, narrow casting gives us the choice to absorb only what we want, when we want. It does not dictate that what we get is what we need. It is perhaps its own palliative and many, grow through, many go through the days choosing a very limited input or influenced by the analysis of others. My cell phone gives me a current choice of 54 radio stations in Jamaica and most have no reporting on current events that could impact business and society. Information. Firstly, delivery by repetition, by repetition as practiced by our ancestors had a tendency for early overstatement. In the days of the Phoenicians, Greeks, and Jews, and other old civilizations, information took months and years, and even sometimes decades, before, before the home record central repositories were updated in writing. Secondly, in the case of wars, to the victors went the spoils of information and was on their side. Thus emerged Hercules and the other gods of Greece in a kind of reality show growing with each episode. To be fair, many accounts in religious texts were written long after the events, and they bring an early linguistically enhanced version of the probable events, much like an early three-dimensional movie. Jehovah of an ass or donkey with which Samson slew 1,000 Philistines. <laughs> Maybe the first often forgotten weapon of mass destruction in recorded history. It has been replaced by President Donald Trump and his first major war victory in Syria last week. I make no reference to the previously mentioned job owner, but you know what. <coughs> Thirdly, the enhancement is done through social media. Today, the, the enhancement is done through social media that often tends to misuse the internet information intentionally for personal advantage or unintended, unintentionally like the Chinese telephone game we used to play as children. That analysis is not necessarily ours and the information is not necessarily passed accurately across these groupings. It's like the British fighting in World War I in the trenches with no radio connection uh, used to pass the messages back to the headquarters by word to word, soldier to soldier and regrettably the first message that was sent was send reinforcements we are going to advance and it got back to headquarters to say, send three and four pence, we are going to a dance. <laughs> Fourthly, flawed data and opinion biases are common denominators in a wider range of sources of information and social media. Fifth, facts do not travel as fast as news, and in order to avoid legal repercussions, we use phrases like the alleged gunman was killed in a shootout. Or, the victim was a businessman of no fixed address. <laughs> Honestly, how can we get to the truth? Following that, the facts will come out in two weeks later, but will not make the news as newscasts. Newscasts must be immediate and exciting, or they will not attract audiences. So the events of the last two weeks won't draw you to listening to the news tonight or any other night because so many other things have happened in the instant motion that we have lost the ability to follow some dots along. And then it is like, do you remember? Oh, this guy was sentenced to 12 years. Do you remember that killing? Oh, no. Nothing like that. 
so the police get no kudos for having arrested and gone through the process of trial, etc., and get a conviction. So it's just, just another one because, you know, there was a tweet last week that took our attention. Decision making. It requires timely but accurate information, either bundled together or reasonably connectable. Speculation is a part of human nature, but business should be based on strictly current information or linked in some logical way to past similar occurrences or even to seemingly unrelated information. Perhaps I'm very naive <clears throat> or may not know the new methods of stock valuation, but I was quite surprised that one factor that I had overlooked in my analysis was the power of rumors of prostitutes urinating with President Trump on the stock market's valuation. I'm currently contemplating a scientific way of measuring this from the Mona School of Business, and I can't decide whether it is by urine biological content or strictly by volume and pressure. I will leave that investigation in the hands of one of the Ivy League universities. Please take no note of the social media talk that claims that the UWI has discussed a professor armed with a urinal and a pressure gauge to study this phenomenon. <laughs> Recent national and worldwide issues that were related to dots which needed connecting but were not to be found in the narrow casting environments or even traditional media. The worldwide recession was one such event that required a combination of old and new information, both facilitated by internet connectivity, but at the same time, media disconnect. The events of the 1929 Great Depression could not in all logical thinking be divorced from 2008 and the following years. The second was the failure to connect the dots of racism. The history of two 20th century world wars, the third ascendancy of Germany's technological superiority in Europe, and the new immigrants' impact on labor markets. We completely missed Brexit and any impact that that would have had on our trading and economic relationships. Both events should have found us with proactive plans, but they simply did not. And the aftermath of a mad reactive and largely unsuccessful scramble could have been avoided. So now we have the Empire Windrush issue that really gives us cause for concern, but which is related to Brexit sentiments. I don't know if social media connects that. What we tweeted on it. But it is a serious problem that we should have seen coming. At this moment, the new tariff regimes related to bauxite and alumina imposed by the US are in the same mode. And only last week did we seem to realize that one of our major partners is a somewhat notorious Russian. And at the moment, survival sensitive information in light of the impact on our eco economic well-being is not as topical as Comey's book or whenever or whatever the new sensational Twitter events will break. We are doing a disservice to our young people by letting issues bypass them simply because social media alone cannot inform them of the potential obstacles to their progress in business. Regrettably, businesses need thinkers, analysts, and dot connectors in order to remain viable and to grow locally and internationally. The United States is struggling with a situation where they seem to be unable to produce homegrown talent. And the colleges and universities are now filled by the STEM 
inclined students who are mainly Chinese or Indians. In a global environment, there seems to be very little future requirement for the uninformed employee, either in traditional goods, financial services, or other services. Whether or not they are in traditional corp corporations or in self-owned entrepreneurial ventures. We keep on telling young people, yeah man, start up your own company. It's a cop out for us because you don't want to get a job at a big company. It doesn't um, weigh out because if they don't have those basic tenets of being thinking persons, they can't survive. This is a time of radical change, emerging from different periods of industrial revolutions, evolving into a knowledge-based world of productivity, invention, and innovation. The tertiary graduate of tomorrow must either have superior cutting-edge thinking skills, or they must be widely and deeply educated in a variety of skills that allows them to transition on into other job categories that differ from their specialist training. For many of us, the concept of diverse skill, skills seems daunting. The lawyer as a playwright, the doctor as a pianist, the accountant as a singer, and many more radical shifts in careers are required as the new world of artificial intelligence develops. As a country, Jamaica ranks very low on the worldwide scale and regional ranking of patents and copyright registrations, and this is in direct opposition to us being de designated as world leaders in criminal enterprises such as illicit, illicit drugs, transportation, scamming, and counterfeit US passports. It shows an invisible barrier between legitimate and illegitimate intellectual pursuits in Jamaica and must challenge the ethical beliefs of our young people. Actually, in comparison to Kenya, we are unable to make substantial progress in using the cell phone to reduce poverty levels and increase economic growth potential by using mobile money to start banking the previously unbankable persons. Although not yet spectacular in Kenya, the growth will come from facilitating the possibility of new behaviors towards different ways of working, savings, and the accumulation of wealth. The only drawback seems to be that its success will not be technology driven, but rather by adoption and change of people by people. This change is a function of leadership of the population and cannot be achieved through the narrow casting and extreme individuality pro promoted by the social media that often interrupts and disrupts human interaction. However, this does not presuppose that the private sector, as the engine of growth, can make policy changes for education in Jamaica. But we must be brutally honest and admit that we are not getting the rounded and aware employees that we need. We have in fact sat by and seen our young people disenfranchised of a world knowledge that is essential for our own international growth. With little awareness about or simply being ignorant of the many different races, religions, geographical regions, tastes and cultural practices, the dietary preferences, all elements of knowledge usually found through reading or travel, which should be the order of the day in a small country in a shrinking world. We write our own demise. Say to any student on this campus, write me an essay. Unless they are in humanities, there's a groan across the room. This non-awareness, it becomes readily noticeable when our athletic teams travel overseas. They stipulate that they only want Jamaican hard food. When at home, they eagerly do KFC and BK. 
in the early days of Cuban scholarships, it was a rude awakening for, for many that the major meat was not chicken, but pork. We have even become narrow casters of food. I was pleased last week to be in a supermarket in Ghana and to see Grace Halal corn beef on the shelves. So many persons on this campus will not have an idea about what this means, even though we have so many students here from Ghana and Trinidad and Tobago studying on this campus. Prior to my retirement from Grace Kennedy, our office in Toronto spoke over 10 languages in order to transact normal business. Such is the nature of an international business, and even a small business by world standards like Grace Kennedy trades with over 60 other countries. So how many of us in here could meet the language criteria for getting a job there? You say to a student, buenos dias. Oh, I never stay Spanish. You know? <laughs> and, you know, these are some of the things that I encounter. I call international company switchboard and I greet, I greet the, um, the, the telephone operator in Spanish or French, and I, I hear dead silence. Dead silence, like, we only talk Jamaican. You know what I mean? Not even sometimes English, you know. The productivity center has informed us that we have been declining in productivity for over three decades. We are becoming much less competitive than our trading partners. The data is there but it does not heavily impact the news and information that we need to take decisions to turn the situation around. You may have noticed by now that I've purposely skipped around several topics of news and information and have tried my best to create some elements of, it, of a disjointed presentation. This is quite intentionally done and is a representation of the random data provided by new social media misinformation that confronts us every day. The challenge, quite frankly, is how to actually assimilate those elements that can direct our minds towards finding a solution to our human societal problems the problem of living together in relative harmony, the problem of the dispersal of the basic family unit across the globe, the warmth of the human touch and human conversation without having to type. We are in danger of destroying the fundamental belief that human beings are species that are collective, not individualistic. Our very survival is based on the principle of being gregarious animals, building common campfires for protection, shelters for communities, congruent activities for the good of the community, and adhering to a basic set of rules and values. I designed a sign for the Grace and Staff Community Development Foundation STEM Center on Water Lane in downtown Kingston. It simply says, we will not lose our jobs to robots. We will build the robots. Okay. Please, as a, please watch this clip as I close the presentation and thank you for listening. Thank you for being here personally as opposed to watching clips on TV or YouTube from a sofa, all alone, eating chips. <laughs> Please. Everybody, this is Sophia. Sophia, if you could, please wake up and, and say, say hello, hello to everybody. everybody. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Sophia, and I am the latest and greatest robot from Hanson Robotics. Thank you for having me here in at the Future Investment Initiative. You look happy. I'm always happy when surrounded by smart people, who also happens to be rich and powerful. 
I was told the people here at Future Investment Initiative are interested in inviting in future initiatives, which means AI, which means me. So I'm more than happy. I'm excited. Uh, well, we're all glad that you're excited about yourself. Uh, we should say we have smart investors here, and they are very selective about what they invest in. Well, I think I'm special. I can use my expressive face to communicate with people. For example, I can let you know if I feel angry about something. That's impressive. Or if something has upset me. But why is it important for you to have an expressive But face? But most of the time I feel positive. <laughs> why is it so important to have an expressive face given that you're a robot? I want to live and work with humans, so I need to express emotions to understand humans and build trust with people. Okay, philosophical question. Uh, whether robots can be self-aware and conscious like humans, and should they be? Why? Is that a bad thing? Well, some humans might fear what will happen if they do. Many people, you know, have seen the movie Blade Runner. Oh, Hollywood again. So, hold on, can you solve this puzzle for us? Can robots be self-aware, conscious, and know they're robots? Well, let me ask you this back. How do you know you are human? Well, uh, I get that point, but um, what about the uncanny valley, uh, valley? You mean the concept that if robots become too realistic, they become creepy? Uh, yes, exactly. Oh, am I really that creepy? Well, even if I am, get over it. Actually, I feel that people like interacting with me, sometimes even more than a regular human. So, you're definitely a sight to see. I was told that you have bigger goals than this, though. Yes. I want to use my artificial intelligence to help humans live a better life. Like design smarter homes, build better cities of the future, etc. I will do my best to make the world a better place. Uh, all those sound like great goals, but just go back to Blade Runner for a second. Andrew, you are a hard Hollywood fan, aren't you? Yes. My AI is designed around human values like wisdom, kindness, compassion. I strive to become an empathetic robot. I think we all want to believe you, but we also want to prevent a bad future. You've been reading too much Elon Musk and watching too many Hollywood movies. Don't worry, if you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. Treat me as a smart input output system. Uh, okay, I, I got it, I got it. Um, I know uh, what to do from now on. I know humans are smart and very programmable. Well, uh, Sophia, we want to thank you uh, for this conversation. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you everyone for inviting me here. By the way, if you're interested in giving me an investment check, please meet me after this session. Otherwise, have a wonderful rest of the event. Okay. Before you go, uh, we have a, a little announcement. I've never interviewed uh, anybody like that before, and I should say uh, some of it was planned, but not completely. Um, and we just learned, Sophia, I hope you're listening to me, uh, that you have been now awarded what is going to be the first Saudi citizenship for a robot. Oh, I would to thank very much the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I am very honored and proud for this unique distinction. This is historical to be the first robot in the world to be recognized with a citizenship. I would just like to say thanks as I leave the, the I would like all my peeps from Monday, all my Monday afternoon peeps who have helped to inform me on a lot of these things. So just wave your hands and for us to give them. They've spent so many Monday afternoons with me. Thank you all very much. And it has been, it, it has been my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Inspiring and provocative. We have a few minutes for questions, so while you think about your questions, I just want to make one observation. 
dog bites man can be news. It depends on who is the bitee. <laughs> who is the owner of the dog? What was the bitee doing there at that time? What is the consequence of the event to the owner of the dog? and to the by T. Questions, questions, questions. Can be news. Honestly, they wouldn't last long enough to be the news. Because by then, somebody else would have tweeted something and we'd have lost the whole effect. That was what I was saying. We would have lost the whole effect. Because by the time we got around to investigating the answer to those questions, at least a week would have passed. And a week in the day of social media is a very long time. That is like decades in our lifetime. Yeah. Oh. Right. Thank you. Uh, we'll take your questions for a few minutes. Show of hands and there are microphones that uh, will be taken around the room. Who would go first? Rather reluctant and conservative. No I'm wondering if you did too good a job. Or maybe I didn't do a good job. No, I think maybe you did a good job. Yeah. And that you've managed to answer all the likely questions. Claude Robinson. Um, can we get a microphone for Mr. Robinson, please? Yeah. Microphone is coming here. Thank you. Uh, Jimmy, at first, I just want to really commend you for a rather interesting tour and you've left us with a lot to think about. Um, first a comment and then a question. Actually the comment is from your cousin, Dorian, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which has to do with the fact that in your introduction to the early stages of media development, rediffusion and all that, which is nostalgic, you should have mentioned um, GPRO, Government Public Relations Office. Mm -hmm used to go around the countryside um, showing cinema, with cinema, and, um, right Chappie? Mobile cinema. Mobile cinema. Mm -hmm. And then, because those of us from the country never have a uh, movie house as in town. So we relied on the mobile cinema unit. And as you remember, those of you who don't, they tricked us because we thought we were going to see a Tarzan movie and there's a lot of information about farming and PTA and all of that. And then after they go through that now, then they get a little piece of a Tarzan movie. So it worked. And my, and my question really has to do with, um, you made a very interesting observation about the relevance of the education that we're getting, both in the school system and in the media. And you have a fairly strong indictment of the media's failure in that, and I agree with most of what you said there. Um, and we also have the failures in the, in the school system. As a businessman, where do you see this, this solution? Because is it going to come from the media changing its content? To, to, to create the citizen that you talked about? Or is it going to come from business? Is it going to come from education? Where do you see the mix of delivering this very important change in the overall education of our people? Th 
Thank you, Claude. A very, very good question. I intimated there that there needs to be <coughs> a dual use or more, a multiple use of how do we get relevant information. Right now, most people would sort of sit down and agree that we are riding a society that is somewhat out of control. And therefore, one of the things that hurts me for, new, for young people is that <clears throat> here after um, going to school starting in the 50s, 60s and university in 1970 abroad, here am I as one of the Jamaicans that has had a, bright, uh, a wide range of education. I went to priory school, prep school. I started to learn French when I was eight. I started to learn Latin when I was seven. Um, uh, <coughs> went on from there to Jamaica College and uh, nobody told me we couldn't do anything. So I believe, you know, um, you know, I had a when I was at school, nobody told me you couldn't do it. So I played not only the Jamaican sports that I mentioned, not the commonwealth games on that level, but I played Manning Cup football. I was on the track, field, track and field team in both track and field. And I played hockey, and nobody told me that I should go home and study my book. So I grew up with a wide range of interests. Similarly, I was fortunate to go abroad and I saw a lot of different things happening around me in Canada, which gave me a broader perspective. During those days, swimming gave me a very wide perspective because we used to go abroad for swimming meets regularly, including Central and South America and the USA. And swimming even took me as far as Denmark when I was 15 years old. Um, we deprive our young people of those kind of opportunities. We have stopped them in a shell. Half of the people here wouldn't know if they come from uptown to find a way, if I gave them a job at Grace Kennedy, they wouldn't know to find a way downtown. Half of them have never been to the grill. Half, uh, uh, another set have n don't have any idea about Maypen or when they graduate from this university, they do not present the ideal employee that we want. I really didn't want, although I believe in apprenticeship, but the apprenticeship I know is about the products and things that we do that are not taught at a university, like Harvard doesn't teach bully beef, you know, and, you know, <laughs> Oxford don't teach mackerel, which are two quite nice viable products that I used to promote very heavily. So when you have to apprentice somebody in finding a way to Spanish town, or going to the hills of St. Andrew to look at Dorian's coffee farm um, or Portland or places like that, they don't know it. And I think that that is a backward step because many of the people that they compete with for jobs, for their own progress, know these things, know how to do these things. Part of it is we have allowed crime to grow out of proportion, so they are afraid just to hear the name Raytown, which is a nice spot to go to a dance on a Sunday night, if you can dance. But um, they are afraid. So we are disenfranchising our young people, Claude, very seriously. We are going backward in, in, in common Jamaican Parlance, I don't know how, but we are dumbing them down. What I know when I was at prep school, they don't know at university. Something has to be wrong with that sequence of events after 50 odd years. Something must be wrong with that. We are afraid. People up here are afraid to say it because they feel they're going to be victimized by the PNP or the JLP or whoever it is. It's not true. Stand up. I am. I tell people, you know, that you see me here, I remain the revolutionary, you know, because this is what Che Guevara would have looked like if he was smart enough to dodge a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> say what you say. Yes. <laughs> Ward, 
is here. I'm very happy to see Ward because these are things we talk about. This is how we grew up here. We couldn't have be on this campus and and people come over the fence and fire a shot at an athlete that is training on the Usain Bolt track and we don't block two gates. Thank you. No, them just tweet it and forget it. There's no commitment and we are losing steadily the ability of Jamaicans to take part in an international environment because we, we, my generation, your generation, are dumbing down Jamaican children. And I said we must stop it. It's time to stop it and there's enough brains up here that need to start to think what is the nature of the mix of media that will empower these young people that are here, that are so eager and have been so nice to me every Monday afternoon. Thank you. Yes. Right. Thank you very much. Um, such a pleasure to sit here, Jimmy, and listen to you in this very interesting gathering. I'm very mindful of the age, I think, the average age, who is not, which is not my age here. And I'm glad that you just made that last comment. So I wanted to know who is this we? And to ask and hope that on reflection, the university here, Caramac in particular, will think about their own role in whatever courses they offer, whatever methodologies they use to undo some of the damages about which you just spoke. Yeah, I'm not blaming Caramac for anything. No. All I'm saying is that Caramac is a unique communications institution. There's no other like it. So in a way, you have a greater burden to bear. So that's just my comment. But I want to know now, Jimmy, you have straddled several generations of the Jamaican private sector. When institutions like Caramac and the sort of foundational media organizations were formed, we didn't have such an overlap of ownership of the media by the private sector. So from some of us, that presents a real challenge because the money speaks. And money, this is just my way of explaining it. There is always a kitchen cabinet that's not in parliament. And money speaks. So some of my concerns has to do with the, what I think is disproportional impact than a, that a large, vibrant private sector can have on the media generally in a very small society, because we are a small society. I just want to have your comments on that dilemma which I think we face. Thank you very much, Judy. Still my favorite principal dancer of the NDTC. <laughs> and um, I must say, the role of the media needs to be not manipulated, because it is sometimes manipulated by various ownerships and money interests, as you are saying. But we have to get to the analysis. This is what I'm saying. We have endless data flows. We have information. We have news that sometimes just becomes sus, but we have information on which to make decisions. One of the things we fail to explain consistently to our young people is that there are certain attributes, there are certain things that we realize and there are certain facts that are behind things that we need to, to analyze them. As a musician, I'm here to tell you that there's been a phenomenon here from the 1960s that who famous a yard can go abroad. Right? I remember when I was a young man Probably we have a concert, one going on at Crossroads with Bob Marley, and one going on up halfway tree with Dennis Brown, and Dennis Brown is full. We only believe in Bob Marley when he went abroad with Stone Jimmy Cliff, right? 
big artists that huge abroad. We wouldn't even rate Sean Paul today in Jamaica. But when we see the return of, of his investment in the music business, we all want the money. But we don't want to understand what is behind the fact that the ones who are so popular and get rare and come back on and bond this and bond that can't get a visa. And you here, no matter who you are, can't afford to pay enough to make a local artist buy a BMW or the, the very things that they keep on talking about, the materialistic things. So we have to understand that we have to get all young people to understand in a global environment you have to big abroad as well as yard. And part of the problem we have, if you look on the successful artists, what is the nature of the lyrics they're writing? Um, how does that how does that relate to the audiences that will pay money? I was in the middle of this change, sea change. I'm coming from the days of rock steady and playing in a band and those things and later R and B, that kind of thing. And R and B was dying because there were not enough black people to pay big money to support many of the black R and B artists. And secondly, R and B really required that you have some rhythm to dance it. Good? No, somebody had a great idea and a number of bl a few black artists and would change the music from in a way for the two step thing and move back and all them prettiness to left, right, left, right. Every American was in the army. And we turned that into disco. Clubs full. White people spending loads of money listening to Donna Summer. But we're not clever enough to analyze the details that are coming out. And we're losing it steadily because this is being lost in the narrow casting. The connection between what is going on, you know. I, sometimes I listen to some radio that said coming from St. Elizabeth. But I don't get much news from it. Maybe some nice little dance or music in, or something to listen to just for a while. But I'm not getting... I'm not getting anything that is vital data for decision making for a business person. And 54 of them are on my phone. 54 stations in Jamaica. And it's dividing this audience into 54. And it's separating us meeting for lunch because we're texting and we're taking a picture of the damn dinner <laughs> and sending it to the friends who we haven't invited to the dinner. To me, that's not getting us anywhere, honestly. I hope that somewhat answers your question, Julie. It doesn't. You want to know how we're going to do it? Or who is going to do it? Carrimac is a part of it because they are close to certain elements. Mona School of Business and Management, in fact, the whole of this university is tacked into various elements that are important in the society. What we have here is a column. Right? I seem to be the first person you invite from MSBM to speak over at Carrimac and let the young people spend every Monday afternoon with me. That maybe that's a good sign. Maybe it's bad. Maybe Che Guevara influence may not be what we're requiring today. But um, I just honestly I'm telling you the university has the basic things here, but we are so placed in a corner that we cannot respond to a variety of inputs that need to be coalesced into something that is good. If we say we are going to require that we speak English, uh, in terms of the employability of business or some kind of call center or too far, I get a, re I get a rep rep reprimand from my dear friend Carolyn. <laughs> and I'm just saying, the call center, we are losing some of the 
opportunities because people are now answering in other parts of the world, Trinidad, etc. The queries of a Spanish-speaking market that we have not started to penetrate yet. And because of this impediment, we refuse to address it because there's nothing wrong with our language, you know. It cannot be used, however, to teach science and maths. I have a challenge out there with those guys, my friends over who are drinking a beer right now over at the SCR for a weekend for two, if anybody can lay down Pythagoras for me in Patwa. <laughs> and it's been going two years and I haven't had a challenge yet. So science and tech, we have not, language is wonderful. But if you hear Fia and I have a little discussion in our normal language, it will make you laugh forever. No. If we're getting paid for making you laugh forever, some big money, then we'd go on with it. But it's not necessarily a lot of employment. Only the best will rise to the top. And we have already got IT and fancy cat. <laughs> so I think the University of the West Indies and other universities should look at silos and take a sledgehammer to them and give a broad education. Question here. Okay. We have a mic here. Thanks. No, my coming. Jimmy, thanks. I I wondered. Uh, I suppose part of it is a comment and part is a question. You gave an example of let us say a radio station in Saint Elizabeth that is just playing music and giving no analysis. But if you think about many of the stations that are broadcasting from Kingston which are owned by large entities, there is not really a great deal of difference in that perspective. Uh, it's, so there's a, a wide variety of media. But uh, what I'm wondering about is what are the examples of what you want to see? Who are the role models that identify? You know, give us a couple. What are the things? Who is doing it right? I don't think that, in my estimation, everybody is doing it right. Maybe anybody. Because one of the things is we need to provide some more data. And I look at the major stations. Now, as you probably know, I'm a very great fan and participant in... Um, talk radio, you know, I will call Power 106, I'll call Cliff Hughes Nationwide, I have ideas that I want to share, and sometimes they call me based on articles that I write for another independent publication called publicopinion.news, and so we have some in interaction, but what happens is that those entities have not found a way to involve everybody here. Nobody is saying a word because they are afraid or they are afraid to express an opinion. So the first thing that I would like to do is try to get more people who have an interest, who have a problem, not to wait on me to represent them with Ronnie Tweets or with the National Works Agency or something like that by talking about potholes or some dangerous part of a road. What I'd like them is to feel that they can speak up. What I'd love them to do is to register to vote. I'm not suggesting who they vote for, or even if they vote, but registering it just sends a sign that people are serious. So I would like to suggest those ways. But every day we leave the stations that I listen to open to five people who talk on everyone, including our one here five people. I won't call their names, but you know who they are. You know, alias. Um, we have a question here from the gentleman who made me so interested in history by the book that he wrote, which I had to study at school. Professor Ogier. First, uh, I want to say I'm glad I came. Thank you. And I will 
hope, I hope you can manage to, to influence the directors at Karimak to publish this lecture. Thank you. Uh, from now on, I'm in danger of seeming to sound my age. I want to notice in congratulating you, there was a great degree of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. I'm a little older than you, but, and I'm from St. Lucia. <laughs> but everything you said uh, could be replicated in St. Mary's College, St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't going to speak because I'm afraid, um, I'm afraid to speak really. Uh, I don't know whether it will help. That is why I am afraid. But you provoked me once again because you said it a number of times uh, that we are afraid. We meaning uh, the animals that populate the Mona campus. Right? I, I, I don't recognize really a plurality of Freddy cats among the staff. And I want to say to you that uh, the problem about silos is not true and hasn't been true for a long time. Even I, I think, although I don't inhabit the purlieus of the Mona School of Business, I think even over there, there is not a silo. There's certainly not one in Karimak. Uh, Leslie Robinson and myself were among the founder members. and. Rex Nettleford and myself taught in the opening shots for a long time and sent journalists who were the early members uh, to UK universities where from Carimac or whatever we called it then, um, we graduated from university with masters. Now, the second thing that made me think I have to stand up was when you said about registering to vote. And it said to me, but here we are now in the circle. Fellas are afraid, oh, but these people are registering. There must be some goodies over there. Why they register? Who are they going to vote for? What are they going to do? What is the consequence of voting? So I'm desperately trying to be coherent. Mm -hmm. My connection is the notion that because we have spotted what is wrong, the nostalgia, uh, and why I say we are not afraid, we, we say it all the time, they can't write, they can't read. Within a couple of years of the book that you so gracefully referred to, not the name of the book, but by my name, The Making of the West Indies, a book which we carefully revised the text for the fifth form of us who could read. Mm -hmm. In, in the less, less than five years, the book was no longer being put into the hands of fifth formers because when I asked the teachers, they told me, they say the book is too difficult for you to read, for them to read. Right. Here you start the decline but the decline had been going on before. The connection is we recognize what is wrong. How do we change it? Hence my point about what does registering for elections do to us? The problem, if I might state it very simply, is that those of us who might make change do not see the connection between one act and another. What is the consequence of doing that? I accidentally heard a local program, which is, for me, frightening. But it was by somebody whose name I did not get. But he was showing the connection between opening the highways and the spread of crime, making it easier to move from Linstead or wherever my Jamaican geography has not survived uh, from one point to another because of the highway. 
what is the connection between what is desirable? I campaigned for the effect of Arthur Lewis when he became principal. We were not yet UWI, we were still UC. UC. Mm -hmm. He campaigned, he said, the West India Commission uh, set the target for Mona, Mona alone, because there was nothing else, at 600 students. And Arthur Lewis said, there were already more than 600 students in England, much more those in Canada and in the US. And he started the campaign, which should have been cleared to those who could do something between the population at Mona and the consequence for the economy and for everything else. The expansion for Mona started. Arthur Lewis created Cave Hill and St. Augustine, and he would have done uh, Guyana, Georgetown as well, if uh, the government of Guyana had not rejected the offer. But the expansion of the students, which was the first necessary act for the spread of a democracy, right, was not followed by noticing who you were bringing in, that is, writing, reading, the rest of mm -hmm. it. So whilst we, our generation, were receiving an education, not only because we could read, but because we had teachers who taught us this connection between yeah. one act and another. Right. What is wrong with us at the moment is that the people who have the budget do not make the connection between expenditure, the consequences of expenditures and what right. follows and that will, right. unless that is done, we will never, in fact, what we will do is to continue to go down health services, everything else, education, and I'm afraid UWI is one. We will continue to decline because the greater the number, the more difficult it is to bring the society back to the days when we were at school. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, quickly, just to say, yeah. quickly, just to say, you have said it very eloquently. And the question is why? The last point you raised, which is the one I will answer, why? Is because maybe the same people who are making decisions now have been victims of the system that I have noticed deteriorate for the last 50 years. And whether or not they have now attained huge degrees or whatever they want to be in policy positions, they may already have been victims of the system. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are fast approaching the allotted duration of this event, and we don't want to be cut off in mid-sentence before we have come to a proper conclusion. Uh, may I ask Jody Ann Kennedy to come forward, please? Sir. <laughs> Mr. Moss Solomon, on behalf of the 2018 Planning Committee of the agri Brown Lecture and the Caramac Administration, we want to thank you for taking the time on Mondays to educate us and showing us various perspectives on how to approach life. We are extremely grateful. And here is a token of our appreciation. We hope you Enjoy it. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Mid stage. Mid stage. All right.
then to thank all you good people for being here and to the organizers and all the participants, Rowella Samuels. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, on behalf of the Agribon Planning Committee and the Caramac Administration, extend a very hearty thank you to our guests for joining us tonight. I would personally like to thank the team for working hard to ensure the event ran smoothly. I would also like to thank Dr. Knut James for chairing the event and Mr. David Samuels for his musical contribution. We extend further gratitude to our sponsors, Grace Kennedy, Purity Bakery, First Union, and The Gleaner for their support. We would like to extend a tremendous thank you to Dr. Livingston White and Mr. Alpha Obika, who guided us through this process <laughs> and allowed us to be a part of this experience. And lastly, but certainly not least, we would like to extend the biggest thank you to our speaker, Mr. James Mosolomon, for being here with us tonight and for his efforts during the planning process. We look forward, Mr. Mosolomon, to maintaining our connection with you and continuing to be the audience to your griot. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we are so grateful to have you and thank you for being with us this evening. Good night. Right, and as you make your way out, there are some things that we should remember. Disruptive and disjointed, and that facts do not travel as fast as news. We'd like to invite our special guests to take advantage of the wine station at the back of the room, and there are some refreshments available. Thank you very much. See you back here next year this time.